Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, yes, so I'm a, a GP in, in South Wales. Uh, come up for the day to, uh, to talk to you. Um, I work in a, quite a low-income uh, community in South Wales Valleys as a GP, uh, and I also do research in Cardiff University around um, management of infections and, and use of antibiotics. And as Hilary said, we did a, a study um, looking at use of antibiotics in COPD patients. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that, um, but also just to kind of give a bit of a more broad overview about the use of antibiotics. Primarily antibiotics for um, acute exacerbations, but um, if we've got time, I'll talk a little bit about use of prophylactic antibiotics as well. So I was going to start off with giving you a sort of general overview, talking about the importance of COPD and the prevalence and, and the implications, but Elaine's already done a great job of doing that, so I think um, we, can, we can skip over that. Um, it's obviously uh, predominantly caused by smoking, but um, also can be caused by uh, uh, environmental pollutants and um, uh, genetic factors, primarily alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, and, um, you know, has, has an important impact. You know, UK has some of the highest mortality rates from, uh, from COPD. So, uh, as you know, COPD is, is associated with uh, acute exacerbations, which are defined as a sudden worsening in symptoms, which can last for, for several days. Uh, and they can be triggered by infections with bacteria or viruses or by environmental pollutants. And I'd like you just to take a moment and think about how you use antibiotics, how you decide when to use antibiotics. Do you have uh, clear criteria? Are they based on one thing or a number of factors? Do you take a more gestalt picture, sort of looking at uh, the patient in general and maybe not have sort of clear sort of uh, tick boxes or criteria? Um, do you think about um, things like antibiotic resistance? Do you worry about prescribing antibiotics or do you think, well, this is a sick population, so, you know, it's better to give them antibiotics? Start off with a little question. What proportion of consultations, primary care consultations for acute exacerbations, do you think end up with an antibiotic prescription? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty high. It's about 80% and it hasn't changed much. This is data from um, uh, CPRD, so a number of different uh, practices in the UK, um, including some Scottish practices. And as you say, as you can see, it, it sort of sat at around 80% of consultations uh, o over that time period. Um, in, out of interest, uh, the prescribing of steroids has changed. So uh, this graph um, shows the, the green boxes here are where patients that got antibiotics and steroids for their acute exacerbation. So the proportion of getting steroids has increased. Very few patients get just steroids. The blue one at the bottom is no antibiotics or steroids. Very few patients get just steroids. Um, we're prescribing more steroids, but the, the overall proportion getting antibiotics stays at about 80% over, over that time period. And there's large variation by practice. So these, these, each bar represents a, a general practice in the CPRD. So the lowest prescribing practices, you know, just, just over 20% of patients uh, uh, with acute exacerbations are getting antibiotic, up to 100% in some of the practices. So very, very large variation in, in practice. Um, one of the studies I did was a focus group study with, uh, with GPs, and um, we were talking about a number of topics, but one of the things that came up was prescribing antibiotics over the phone. And um, uh, I sort of asked them whether they were comfortable with prescribing antibiotics over the phone, and as you can see, the first GP he said, well, you know, I says it's reasonable uh, way of managing uh, individuals based on symptoms. Um, in their guidance, they say it's reasonable to issue antibiotics uh, or stand by prescription for antibiotics. Um, so you can base an assessment on symptoms, but you know, as you can see, we're a bit cautious. We're all a bit cautious about doing it. And I said, does everybody agree with that? And another GP said, well, most of your COPD patients, you probably know them really, and, and I would base it more on symptoms. And um, you know, the findings, the clinical examination findings may change if I'm going to admit them or not. Um, or whether they need nurse at home treatment. But if I've got a COPD patient who exacerbates regularly and rings me up and says he's more breathless and producing more sputum, I've made my choice already. He's going to get antibiotics, to be honest. 
And then the next GP said, well, I think the choice of antibiotics is highly likely in this case, and, you know, you'll make that much more on the symptoms. It's then the decision about steroids, you know, and that's, that's when perhaps you need a physical examination to weigh your decision a bit more. And then the fourth GP said, well, you see, I'd go the other way around. I, would be, uh, I wouldn't give the antibiotics unless there was a clear indication. And actually, this was a theme that kind of came out over the focus groups, that there were some um, GPs who... I sort of said, well, actually, I, I would give steroids most of the time, but I'm very cautious about antibiotics. And, and, the, and, a, and a majority that were kind of the other way around, so said, well, I give antibiotics most of the time, and I'm, I'm kind of cautious about steroids. But there was this division, you know, there was these differing views. So, um, when are you supposed to give antibiotics? Have you heard of the Antonison criteria? You probably have. You probably just haven't called them Antonison criteria. These are the Antonison criteria, increased breathlessness, increased sputum volume, and increased sputum purulence. And this was based on a landmark study conducted by Antonison, no doubt. Um, and uh, they identified that the more of these criteria you had, the more likely you were to benefit from antibiotics. So they, they labeled them type 1 exacerbations, where you had all three of those criteria type 2 exacerbations where you have two criteria, and type 1 exacerbation where you just have one of those criteria. And um, they did a randomized controlled trial where patients were randomized to antibiotics or placebo, and uh, they looked at benefit. Now, I'm just going to first of all point out, so this is the group that got antibiotics, this is the group that got placebo, and these patients recovered. Now, there's a difference here, more patients recovered in the antibiotic group, but you know, nearly 60% recovered um, in the placebo group uh, by 20, day 21. Um, and these, this group uh, had what they called an incomplete recovery. So they, 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 weren't getting, they, they were on their way to getting better. But they, they, they still had some symptoms. Um, so if you put those together, close to 80% of the group that got placebo were, you know, getting better by day 21. When they looked at it by those three criteria, so uh, type 1 or type 2 or type 3, you can see clearly the type 1 exacerbations, not as many of them recovered overall, and there was a more marked difference between the antibiotic and the placebo group, and less of a difference in the type 2 exacerbations and virtually no difference in the type 3 exacerbations. So this kind of became the standard of care that these were the criteria that you should use for deciding when you should use antibiotics. But interestingly, these criteria, they weren't, they weren't um, developed from the data. They were criteria that they had selected ahead of time and then tested whether those criteria predict, were predicted. And so for, for many, many years, this, these were the criteria. Um, but why is it that a lot of people get better without antibiotics? Well, uh, data from looking at sputum samples suggests that around a third of patients have a, a bacterial infection triggering the exacerbation. Around a third of them have got a viral infection, and around a third of them have had their exacerbation triggered by other factors like you know, pollutants and changes in the weather and so on. So it's actually a minority of, of patients that are having their acute exacerbation, their acute worsening of COPD, triggered by a bacterial infection. So as you can see, the evidence is suggesting they don't all need antibiotics. What does NICE say? Um, so NICE used to use those Antonison criteria, those three criteria. They've changed, and they now say that antibiotics should be used to treat exacerbations that are associated with a history of more purulent sputum. Okay, so just one of those criteria. Um, and that patients without more purulent sputum do not need antibiotics unless there's consolidation on the chest x-ray uh, or, or clinical signs of pneumonia. Okay, so you should always think about pneumonia as a separate diagnosis. But if they don't have pneumonia, haven't got a chest x-ray of evidence of pneumonia, then uh, more prudent sputum. And that's what NICE is. And where does that come from? You know, what's, what's the evidence behind that? So uh, there's a Cochrane systematic review. Now, if you're not used to looking at these things, this is a forest plot, shows the sort of uh, level of evidence. Um, the... the um, markers to this side show that antibiotics are uh, better, um, and if it crosses the line, then it's not a significant effect. Now, overall, yeah, so the overall effect of antibiotics is shown here, but uh, they've been divided into three different groups. So the bottom group here is use of antibiotics in the intensive care unit. The middle here is use of antibiotics in uh, inpatients. And the uh, top here is outpatients or patients in the community.
And basically, in, if we think about use of antibiotics in the community, um, this little uh, diamond does fall to the, to the right side um, of the line. Uh, and it's just significant. Basically, the, uh, where is it gone now? Uh, 0.75. So the, there's about a 25% um, reduction in, um, uh, uh, 20, 20 or 25% more people will get better um, if, if you use antibiotics overall. But that sort of, that's the overall effect. And, and as we sort of have shown, you know, not all patients benefit from antibiotics. So what we really want to do is to try and identify those patients that are going to get better, are going to benefit from antibiotics. Um, so one of the studies um, that was on that, that thing, I think is probably one of the most useful studies. Um, it's a more recent study. Some of the studies were quite old. Some of them were hospital outpatients rather than primary care. This was a study that was conducted in, in the primary care setting. Um, it's a fairly recent study. And uh, essentially, they randomized them to amoxicillin with clavulinate or placebo. Um, and uh, they looked at uh, uh, outcomes. And the primary outcome they looked at was cure by days 9 to 11. Uh, and as you can see, about 60% of patients in the placebo group were cured by, by day 9 to 11 and 74% uh, in the uh, uh, antibiotic group. So a significant increase in, in cure rate. And uh, if you count clinical success, which is either cure or getting better, um, you've got about 80%. So it's so pretty high still in the placebo group um, versus 90% in the um, uh, amoxicillin clavulinate group. Uh, interestingly, in this study, they also found um, a difference in terms of the days to the next exacerbation. So patients who had a prescription, uh, who had a course of antibiotics, um, had a, a longer time period until their next exacerbation. Um, so, you know, good evidence that antibiotics are, are, are having an overall effect. But what was really interesting about this study is they went on and looked at who were the patients who were... were uh, who had placebo, but were still likely to get better. What were the predictors of, of getting better without antibiotics? And uh, essentially, so you've got the three sort of Antonison criteria here. You've got increased breathlessness, increased volume, and increased purulence. And if you just look at these numbers here, as, as I'm sure you know, P less than 0.5 is considered significant. So these two are not significant. Increased dyspnea and increased sputum volume don't predict you getting better without antibiotics, or, or not getting better without antibiotics. Um, but the sputum purulence does. So sputum purulence is the, is the thing that sort of predicts the benefit from antibiotics. But also, interestingly, they measured CRP levels. And um, they found that measuring CRP in a CRP greater than 40 was also predictive of benefit from antibiotics. Okay, So those are the, the two main predictors that came out in that study. Now, another recent study um, uh, looking at outpatient treatment is, again, um, and this was, a, they were using doxycycline, and they were particularly interested in that effect on time to next exacerbation. And uh, essentially, um, what this graph shows is that there was no difference in the groups. So uh, in, in this study, there wasn't really any evidence that taking a course of antibiotics prolongs your time to next exacerbation. And this is just showing that when they looked at it by different subgroups, by age, by uh, COPD status, smoking status, uh, they didn't find any, any groups that, that benefited. So coming back to CRP, C-reactive protein, as you probably know, CRP is a, a, an inflammatory marker. Um, and it is now increasingly available as a point of care test. You can get devices. Um, this is the device that we used in our study. Um, it's a desktop machine about this big. You can now get handheld devices. They're, they're sort of coming down in size and price uh, and becoming more available. Does anybody have CRP point of care testing in their practice? No. I suspect it's going to be starting to come in in, in the near future. You know, it's increasingly being shown as a useful tool for sort of this antibiotic stewardship. But there wasn't much evidence. There was evidence in sort of acute cough, not in COPD patients, but there wasn't really much evidence as to whether this was a useful tool in, in patients with, with CRP, sorry, COPD. So we did a study which we called PACE, um, looking at whether using a, 
point of care test, a CRP point of care test, was helpful in, in patients with um, acute exacerbations of COPD um, in, in primary care. And these are preliminary results, um, so please don't sort of uh, publish them, broadcast them, tweet them, or anything like that, because they haven't been through peer review or been published yet. Um, so this was the, the PICO, the, the sort of layout of the trial. The participants were patients in primary care with acute exacerbations. Uh, we, the intervention was this CRP point of care test. Plus we gave the clinicians some training in how to interpret that, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, the control patients didn't have the CRP test. Uh, and we looked at antibiotic consumption within four weeks. So it wasn't just whether they got antibiotic at the initial consultation. If they came back a week later and got antibiotics, they would count. Um, but also, we wanted to, you know, we were aiming to, to reduce overall antibiotic use, but not at the expense of harming patients. So we, we looked at what we call his COPD health status um, at two weeks point to make sure that we weren't making patients worse off by withholding antibiotics. And this is a sort of summary of the guidance that we gave. So we said if, if the CRP is less than 20, then antibiotics are unlikely to be beneficial. You should still use your clinical assessment. Clearly, if the patient's got evidence of consolidation or something, uh, you know, they're, they're clinically very unwell, you should treat them accordingly. But by and large, if they've got a CRP less than 20, you shouldn't be giving them antibiotics. If they've got a CRP less, uh, greater than 40, then antibiotics are more likely to be beneficial. Unless you've got a clear reason why you think the CRP is raised for some other reason, then you should definitely be considering antibiotics. There's always, with CRP, there's always a bit of a middle range where it's probably less helpful and you need to be guided by other things. And of course, as we've already said, sputum purulence is probably the most useful thing. So in that middle range, we suggest that you use you know, your, your clinical assessment in addition to the CRP. And um, these were the patients that we included. So uh, we had um, about 650 patients. Um, about uh, a quarter of them had just one of those Antonison criteria. 30% had uh, two of the criteria, and 45% of them had a type 1 exacerbation, which is where they've got all three of those criteria. And uh, as I say, we were looking at antibiotic consumption and um, COPD health status, which we measured with a questionnaire called the CCQ, the COPD, uh, COPD clinical questionnaire. Um, and we had good follow-up rates. Over 80% of patients stayed in the trial and, and gave us follow-up data. So, so that's pretty good. And this, I think this is an important slide. So this is showing what those CRP values were in, in the participants. And uh, as you can see, the vast majority of them have got very low CRP levels. 76% of them had values less than 20. So that's really helpful. You know, lots of them come back with low lab values where we can you know, quite comfortably uh, reassure them that antibiotics are unlikely to be beneficial. Um, another 12% were in that intermediate range. Um, so fully, so 88% of them were, were less than 40, um, which is very helpful. And then we had 12% with, with higher values. And what did we show? Well, so as I say, primary outcome was use of antibiotics within four weeks. And in the control group without CRP, 77%, so very close to that 80% we talked about had an antibiotic. In our CRP group, only 57%. So there was a 20% absolute reduction in antibiotic use. Um, and uh, there's the adjusted odds ratio. Um, so why is that important? Well, you know, clearly I'm sure you've all heard about antibiotic resistance and the importance of reducing antibiotics as a kind of global public health problem. Um, but also for individuals, um, I mean, patients get confused thinking antibiotic resistance is something which affects them. It doesn't affect your, your own body, but it does affect the commensal organisms that reside within your body. And patients with COPD are more likely to have organisms in their respiratory tract, and they're more likely to have pathogens who reside in their respiratory tract. So when you give them antibiotics that aren't benefiting them, they're more likely to have resistant organisms that can then trigger another infection that can be resistant, as well as obviously passing it on to other people. So uh, plus, you know, um, the side effects from antibiotics, you give people diarrhea, you can throw them into hospital. Um, so there's, there's lots of good reasons for avoiding unnecessary antibiotics. But did we harm the patients by reducing their antibiotic use? Well, no. Um, so this is the CCQ scores, and a lower score is better health. You know, you're, you're in better condition with a lower score. Uh, and you can see we had a slightly lower score 
in the CRP group. So they actually felt slightly better at two weeks than the group that got the antibiotics. Um, that was actually a significant, it was a statistically significant difference. It's not a clinically meaningful difference, so we're not saying that they, you know, they, 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 they're going to feel better. But there was certainly no evidence that we're harming them, that we're making them worse off by, by withholding antibiotics. We had a range of secondary outcomes. I'll just share a couple of them with you. So we looked at antibiotic prescribing, sorry, antibiotic consumption for any reason, um, and a uh, very similar difference. So they weren't taking a lot of other, other antibiotics for other things like sore throats or um, that they, the, the antibiotic difference that we found was, was real. Um, the prescribing at the index consultation, so most of the antibiotic consumption was from antibiotics prescribed at the index consultation. And interestingly, we wondered whether actually the group not getting antibiotics were getting a lot more steroids, but there was no evidence of that. So basically use of other treatments was, was very similar between the two groups. So there was no evidence that they were, they were just supplementing the antibiotics but by getting, giving a lot more steroids. Now, one of the things we also did was um, look at um, their sputum and we identified uh, whether they had um, res known respiratory pathogens, bacterial pathogens in their sputum. And um, we looked at that by their CRP status and whether they, um, and, the, and the sputum purulence, the level, you know, the sort of degree of color. We used these little color charts to, to assess sputum purulence. So these first two um, here um, are the CRP less than 20. These middle two are CRP 20 to 40, and these two are CRP greater than 40. And then you've got no, no pathogen here and a pathogen here. And these are the sort of grades of, of sputum purulence. So essentially, if you've got a low CRP and um, no purulence, then you know, you're very unlikely to have, so the, in, in, the, in the sort of no pathogen group, most patients um, have, have not, but, but there's still a few patients with purulent sputum where we didn't find, they've got a low CRP and we didn't find a, a pathogen. As you kind of move up to, um, uh, so these are the ones with pathogen, and as you can see, there's a lot more sort of sputum purulence. And then as you move up along to the sort of the higher uh, CRP categories, and you've got um, a lot more patients with uh, purulent sputum. Um, so you can see there's a nice interaction there. So again, backing up that previous study, that both CRP and purulence seem to sort of independently predict um, response to antibiotics and finding pathogens in the sputum. So that's, um, that's talking about antibiotics for acute exacerbations. Um, how am I doing for time? Yep. Five minutes. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, basically the, sort of the, the key messages are that um, uh, antibiotics are not needed for all exacerbations. Most patients get better without antibiotics. Um, and that you should be using the, the color or purulence of the sputum um, as, a, as a sort of key guide for, for prescribing antibiotics. Um, I should note that um, there's some, some studies uh, demonstrating that patient reported purulence doesn't necessarily correlate well with the objective purulence. So uh, it's always worth trying to look for, a, you know, ask the patient uh, to produce a sample uh, and try and get an objective assessment of purulence. Um, there are, as I say, there are color charts available. Uh, we're actually hoping to do some more research on, on assessing the use of those color charts. But um, I think, you know, if you can get some sort of more objective uh, assessment rather than just asking the patient, well, you know, is there a color to it? Um, and then CRP uh, appears to be, you know, a, a very useful tool as well. And as I say, I expect it's something which probably will be starting to be introduced more. So very quickly, you're probably all familiar with the, the fact that macrolides are uh, increasingly being used to try and prevent COPD exacerbations. I'm not an expert in this area, but I will just sort of summarize um, some of the evidence. So uh, this was a recent systematic review. There were seven studies that have assessed this um, with uh, over 1,600 patients. And um, again, this is one of those forest plots. So the overall, you can see this little diamond is a summary of these results, and uh, it shows a, a, a benefit uh, in terms of uh, reduction in the number of, of people having an, an exacerbation in the follow-up uh, for those on, um, on macrolide antibiotics. Um, 
and uh, the risk ratio there is 0.7, so about a 30% reduction in, in um, the number of patients having an exacerbation. Um, if you look at it by, by type of antibody, type of macrolide and duration of treatment, I guess the key finding here is that the longer duration treatments are, have more of an effect. So these were six to 12 months. Um, the ones with three months were less uh, significant. Um, so it, it seems to be a longer duration of courses that uh, uh, are effective, um, or at least that's where we got the evidence. <coughs> um, does it affect your chance of hospitalization? Well, no evidence of that. Um, you could say this appears to be going very slightly, but essentially that's a non-significant result. So uh, after these seven studies, we've got no evidence of a statistically significant effect in terms of hospitalization. And does it cause any harm? Well, yes. This, this is looking at adverse effects, and there's, there's clear evidence here about a 55% increased risk of adverse effects uh, from the antibiotics. That's things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, and that's not even taking into account the effect on antibiotic resistance. So clearly some downsides as well, um, but uh, you know, again, I think, I think there's more research needed in this area, but, um, but something which can uh, clearly prevent exacerbations in, in some patients. And that's all I was going to say. Thank you very much. Hi, did you use the oral steroids with the patients that you didn't give antibiotics to and antibiotics to? Yeah, so, as we... yeah, so we left the, the steroid prescribing up to the decision of the clinicians. We didn't control that. Um, and as I say, it was fairly equal between the groups. So, so um, uh, trying to remember, I think it was about 40% of them got steroid or steroids as well. Um, but um, it was, as I say, it was, it was not, we didn't control that aspect of them. And in fact, we didn't tell them whether to prescribe antibiotics. We said, this is the guide, you know, it, you've got the CRP, but you don't have to follow the guide. You can overrule the guide. You know, you can, you, it's still your decision what you're going to prescribe for the patient. But you've got, you know, for the patients in the intervention arm, you've got this result to help guide that decision. And what, what's your thoughts on patients having just in case prescriptions at home to, to start up? Of, of, of their own accord. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's certainly in the guidance, isn't it? That um, you know, uh, I, I th that there is, you know, there is, there is some evidence that um, you know, self management uh, is a beneficial thing. Um, but I think uh, it's it, it ideally needs to be a package of self management rather than just a prescription. There's there's precious little evidence that just giving people prescriptions to keep at home actually makes a difference despite the fact that it's recommended, which, you know, obviously, if we can reduce hospital, hospital admissions, that's important for patients and important for costs and so on. Um, so I think, I think it does have a role. Uh, as I sort of hinted at earlier, we're, we're, we're hoping to do some more research looking at whether, you know, giving patients uh, antibiotics to keep at home along with sputum color chart guides um, will be beneficial. Um, and you know, I suspect this, this CRP, you can now get CRP tests where you just take a finger prick, uh, you, you take a, a drop of blood from a finger prick, you put it in a test tube and you can put a little um, strip in and get a, a quantitative, um, you know, CRP value. So we're not that far away from patients being able to actually mess, measure their CRP at home. Whether that's a good idea or not, I, I'm, you know, I'm not saying, but, um, you know, I think, I think, yes, you know, uh, we should be trying to encourage more and more in the right patients, um, but I think this self-management is, is important. In the context of a telehealth trial, um, where the patients were measuring the, um, the standard criteria and had their own standby antibiotics and steroids, the, the um, consumption of antibiotics and steroids rocketed in the telehealth group because it kept flagging them up. It made not a scrap of difference to admissions to summarize a trial for you there but it's so it's put it's exactly the same message as you're giving there are many people that don't benefit mm. and we need to target better yeah, yeah. i think is the message isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely okay one more question is there any role for maybe sputum culture to guide antibiotic prescribing perhaps in those patients who you think well oh, you've had quite a few antibiotics um perhaps you should try to avoid prescribing here but of course you run the risk that they may have been colonized with organisms and what are your views 
Yes, I think, I think there is a role for culture. I, I, don't, I don't think um, we need to be doing culture on all patients, but as, as you say, you know, patients who um, are perhaps at higher risk because they've had repeated courses, uh, it can be useful. Bear in mind, though, that some of the pathogens that we're trying to identify, um, do, they're not very hardy and they will die off in transport. So having a negative culture doesn't mean that there isn't a pathogen there. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a sensitive test for, for de detecting uh, bacterial infection, but it can be helpful in terms of, you know, if you, if you have got a pathogen, then for looking at resistance and so on.